This evening, we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled Psalms. Now, with this as the focus, if you would, let's open our Bibles to Psalms chapter 10. And as you make your way to the 10th chapter of Psalms, I just want to take a moment to set the stage for this incredible psalm. And I should first point out that we don't really find a signature for the lyrics of this song. And so there is some debate about the authorship of this psalm. Some are just, you know, okay with saying we don't know. Uh, but, uh, but others, you know, of course, always want to try to figure out, you know, who wrote it. And you might be interested to know that some believe that this psalm is actually the second half of the ninth psalm. And if that is in fact the case, then this would also mean that this psalm was written by King David, because we know that the ninth psalm was written by King David. And if this is the second half of the same psalm, then David is the author of this as well. With that, I would point out that uh, David Guzik points out that there are more reasons to doubt this than to believe it. And there are many who insist that this psalm is rightly separated into its own chapter because they believe it's its own psalm altogether. It's also interesting to note here that this psalm is actually preceded by seven psalms which were written by King David. Not only, uh, not only that, but the, the next 22 psalms that follow were also written by King David. And seeing how this anonymous psalm was placed in the midst of uh, this series of psalms written by King David, well, there are those who insist that those who were compiling the psalms, they placed this poem here in the middle of all these King David psalms because they believe that this psalm was probably written by King David as well. That may or may not be the case. I'll let you decide for yourself. But regardless of the author's identity, what we can say for sure is that this song is a psalm of lament. This is a psalm of mourning. A.R. Fawcett sums up the content of this psalm in this way, and I quote him here. The psalmist mourns God's apparent indifference to his troubles, which are aggravated by the successful malice, blasphemy, pride, deceit, and profanity of the wicked. On the just and discriminating providence of God, he relies for the destruction of their false security and the defense of the needy. More simply put, the psalmist here is taking the time to share his struggles as he considers his concerns regarding the reason for why the Lord seemed to have been allowing evil people to engage in their wicked ways, all, all the while allowing him to be affected by it all. And it's for this reason that he began this psalm by presenting the problem of evil, as well as an explanatory theos, uh, the, theodicy that, that stems from uh, his faith in the Lord. And just to be clear about this, uh, the word theodicy, it refers to the, uh, any attempt to justify or defend the righteousness of God by offering a rational reason for why he allows wickedness to impact and affect this world. The, the problem of evil says, well, why, why does a good and loving God allow evil to exist? And a theodicy then attempts to give a reason for why that is. And as we make our way through the psalm before us tonight, we're going to consider the theodicy which was presented by the author of this song. Well, with this as the focus... Let's pick up our overview of this incredible book. Uh, let's turn our attention now to Psalms chapter 10. If you would look with me there, we'll begin at verse 1. Here the psalmist cries out, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Wow. Wow. Uh, here in the very first verse of this chapter, you know, we find the psalmist, he's presenting this problem of evil, and he does this with two simple questions. To sum it up simply, the psalmist wants to know why the Lord was allowing the troubles of this world to affect him. He's saying, why do you stand afar off while wicked people do all of these things? Why does it seem like you're hiding when I'm in the midst of these trying times? You know, we, we must not fail to notice the, the, the false accusation that's found in the, these loaded questions there in verse 1. The psalmist is already concluding that the Lord was, in fact, hiding. Now, now, do you think that the Lord is hiding? I don't think the, that the Lord is hiding in troubling times. But the psalmist here has concluded that the Lord was actually hiding in the times of his trouble, which is a veiled accusation. And just to be clear about the troubles that he's talking about, that, that word trouble found at the end of verse 1, it, it can also be rendered anguish, affliction, 
and adversity. It's for this reason that Robert Young translated verse 1 in this way. Why, Jehovah, dost thou stand at a distance? Thou dost hide in times of adversity. The troubles that the psalmist is referring to, well, he's referring to times of adversity. And for the sake of clarity, you know, the psalmist goes on to describe these times of adversity by going on to refer to the calamity that is being caused by evil people. Now, to make my case, let's continue to consider the way that the psalmist describes his troubles here in the 10th Psalm. If you would uh, look with me there beginning at verse 2. Here he declares, The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. Now here in these verses we find the psalmist, he's presenting a list of the troubles being caused by wicked people. And for example, it's there in verse 2 where we learn about the way in which those who have acquired the, the power that comes from worldly wealth, well, they use their privilege to persecute the poor and oppress the impoverished. And it's sad to say that this class-based oppression is still happening all over the world today. This was not only true of the time when this psalmist was writing, but it's also true today. Those with money tend to oppress those who don't have the money to defend themselves. And we see this play out in the courts all the time. Not only that, but it's there in the second half of the verse, uh, of verse 2, where the psalmist describes the way in which the wicked were using their power to devise evil schemes as they engage in their sinful plots and immoral plans. It's for this reason that the psalmist cries out, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? In other words, why are you allowing all of these wicked people to engage in all of these evil schemes? Why do you sit back and allow all of this to happen? We should also notice there in verse 3 where the psalmist also points out that the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. In other words, rather than repenting of their evil desires, the wicked rejoice in their greedy desires as they renounce the Lord. And it's for this reason that again the psalmist cries out, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? In other words, why is the Lord allowing evil people to renounce him? You know, once a person renounces the Lord, I mean, the Lord would be just to just destroy them, but he doesn't. He allows them to continue living. He allows them to continue engaging in their acts of evil. And, and, and so the psalmist is saying, why? why? Why are you, you know, failing to stop their evil schemes? With these questions in mind, we should also notice how the psalmist continues to present the problem of evil as he describes the prosperity of the wicked. If you would uh, look with me again here at the 10th Psalm, we'll pick up at verse 4. Here the psalmist declares, The wicked in his proud uh, countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. Now here in these verses we find the psalmist struggling to understand why God allows those who reject him to then go on to enjoy personal prosperity. Not only does the Lord allow them to continue living in their rejection of him, but he also allows them to prosper in, in their sinful schemes. And, and, he, and so the psalmist is trying to make sense of the fact that those who are too proud to submit themselves to the Lord also seem to go on to become successful in everything they do. Now, I'm sure we all realize that this isn't entirely true. This isn't entirely true because there are unbelievers who are not, all, not only morally bankrupt in their wicked ways, but they're also financially bankrupt. Many unrepentant unbelievers, you know, go on to to live, uh, you know, a life of poverty as well. And so it's not to say that all wicked people go on to become these huge successes and, you know, wealthy people. And yet I'm certain we all realize that, you know, there are unbelievers who are successful in this world. 
there are unbelievers that God allows to enjoy the power and the privilege of worldly wealth as they enjoy the finer things of earthly success, all the while rejecting and renouncing our creator. And just as the psalmist explains that those who use evil means to become successful in their sins are oftentimes the same people you know, who are quick to insist that they have nothing to fear from God. That they have no fear of God because they don't believe that they're ever actually going to face the just judgment of a holy God. It's for this reason that the psalmist cries out, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? These wicked people who think they'll never get their comeuppance, why doesn't the Lord step in and just reveal a little bit to them? Why doesn't the Lord just step in and bring in some, some finite punishment so that they might wake up and realize that real judgment is coming. Chances are we've all struggled with similar questions. Why doesn't God step in and punish those who are successful in their sins? Why does he stand afar off? Why, why does he allow the wicked to engage in all of their evil schemes? And as we consider the way that, that God does seem to stand afar off, and, and there are times when it, it kind of appears like, like he's hiding from what's happening here in the world, we have to ask, well, you know, is, is God culpable? Is God, is God to blame for these things? If he's not going to do anything about it, then, then is, the, is the wickedness of the world his fault? Well, with these questions in mind, let's continue to take some time to consider how the psalmist explains his concerns about the problem of evil. I want to pick up our study of the 10th psalm, beginning at verse 7. Here, the psalmist declares, His mouth, speaking of the wicked, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Now here in these verses we find the psalmist, he's continuing to, to describe the, the wicked ways of evil people. And we should notice there in verse 7 where we learn that the mouth of evil people, it's full of cursing and fraudulent deceit, which results in the oppression of those who end up being deceived. And it's in the second half of verse 7 where we learn about these, the, the troublesome mischief caused by those who use their tongues to spread sinful speech knowing that there were those who were using their tongues to cause all kinds of trouble, the psalmist again began this psalm by crying out, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Why do you allow all of this to continue? Without debate, slanderous speech is most certainly a sin. And and, and so are the sinful schemes of wicked people, which include the predatory plots that the psalmist is describing here in our text tonight. For example, again, verse 8, the psalmist refers to those who are lurking in secret places. What a bunch of creepers. They're lurking in secret places in order to murder the innocent and the helpless. And it's there in verse 9 where he compared those predators to a stalking lion that lies in wait secretly in order to catch his unsuspecting prey. It's like those YouTube videos of kids at the zoo behind glass and the lion's on the other side. And, and you see in the video the lion charging up to the glass and actually smacking into the glass. And, and the reason why is because they want to eat that baby. They're trying to eat that baby and, and the glass gets in the way and stops them. But that's how lions are. They're, they're going to try to find a victim. They're going to try to find some prey to consume. And that's how the psalmist is, is describing wicked, evil people. They're, they're, they're lying in wait for an easy target. It's in verse 10 where the psalmist describes the way in which the helpless victims are then crushed as they fall beneath the strength of those who are wicked. And all the while, the wicked are convinced that they're never going to face the just judgment of God. 
Again, let's consider how the psalmist puts it there in verse 11. He describes the wicked as those who believe that God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. They're not worried about the day of judgment because they're thinking if there is a God, he'll forget by then that I did anything. Or, Or he's not looking at me. He's not paying attention to me. So what do I have to worry about? The scholars who created the New Living Translation, they render verse 11 in this way. The wicked think God isn't watching us. He has closed his eyes and won't even see what we do. In other words, the wicked, they aren't worried about the day of judgment. And the reason why is because they don't really believe there's going to be a day of judgment. They don't really believe that they're going to be punished or that God is even going to remember that they ever sinned. It's for this reason that the psalmist cries out, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble. Now, as we consider these two questions that are found back in verse one, you might be interested to know that his concerns are based on a, a subset of a theodicy, which has to do with the divine hiddenness of God. You know, as we consider reasons that we might uh, realize why God isn't stepping in and stopping evil at this period of time. One of the arguments within the, within the uh, greater subject of theodicy is the hiddenness of God, or in other words, the lack of righteous response from God seems to suggest that he either can't or simply won't respond to the evil deeds of wicked people. And the chances are we've all wrestled with the divine hiddenness of God at one point in time or another when we were really expecting God to come in and step in and deal with something that was evil, but he didn't. And he, in effect, remained hidden from those who are wicked. I have no doubt that we've all wondered about the reasons for why the Lord seems to stand afar off as he allows the wicked people of this world to accomplish their evil schemes. And while our questions about the divine hiddenness of God has caused many to question his goodness, it's important for us to realize that the Lord has righteous reasons for the evil that he has allowed. And how do I know that? Well, because God is the source and the standard of righteousness. Without God, we have no standard of righteousness. And because God is righteous, and because God is infinite, then he must be infinitely righteous, meaning right all the time. God has a righteous reason for the evil that he allows. And as we consider what's happening in the world today, and as we continue to consider how wickedness seems to be ramping up here in this world, I want to take a moment to consider a prophecy that Paul presents in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's beginning at verse 7 where he declares, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. From this we can see that there is a mystery of lawlessness which Paul said back in the first century is already at work. It was there in the first century where the mystery of lawlessness was already at work. And while it's true that the Holy Spirit was sent uh, to, to keep a cap on the level of lawlessness that could be occurring on any given day, well, it's also true that this mystery of lawlessness helps us to see that this lawlessness in the world will continue ramping up until the day when the restrainer is finally removed. It's at that point in time when lawlessness will abound in this world And that will result uh, in in the rise of the Antichrist and in in his uh, being empowered by Satan, lawlessness will continue to abound during the final seven years of the tribulation. Now, in light of this prophecy, there should be no doubt that there are evil people currently in positions of power who have been involved in satanic schemes which will culminate in the rise of the Antichrist. And, and I, I find it amazing whenever I run into believers who think that like they've got to somehow elect the right person who will stop the Antichrist or something like that. 
Like they're convinced that if we can just get the right people in politics and and in office and and making the right decisions, then somehow we can stave off this day when the Antichrist will finally rise up. No. The prophetic word of God tells us this is happening. The mystery of lawlessness has been happening since the first century and it will continue to happen until the day when the restrainer is removed. And, And who's allowing all of this to happen? God. God's allowing this to happen. God's allowing evil people in positions of power to engage in true international depression. I'm, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. And, and there are wicked globalists creating conditions for world domination through globalist organizations that are working hard to implement a one-world government which will include a central bank digital currency all in an attempt to control the masses through a, through a single government, through a, through a single currency, and a singular religious belief system which will require every person to come and worship the Antichrist so that they can take part in the one-world system which will ultimately be under the control of Satan which will ultimately be under the control of God. With all this being the case, we must not forget that the Lord is going to allow all this to happen. Within his economy, he's going to allow all this to take place according to the perfect purposes which will result in the second coming of Jesus Christ. With all this in mind, it's crucial for every Christian to realize that the Lord has his righteous reasons for the evil that he allows. And while this might be difficult to hear, it's important for us to remember that the Lord is using the trials and the troubles of this world to provide us with a path for our perfection. James put it best in the first chapter of his epistle. It's there where he declares, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, now you might be listening to these verses thinking, "Uh, didn't we just hear this recently? Yeah. And I continue to come back to this because the last time I taught this passage, I walked out out of the pulpit and got in my truck and drove down the road. And next thing you know, I'm angry with the first driver that cuts me off. And I'm like, oh yeah, wait, didn't I just, didn't I just say something about patience leading to my perfection? How easy is it for, uh, for us to for, How easy is it for us to forget these things? And, and we find ourselves in the middle of a trial. And rather than rejoicing, knowing that the testing of our faith is producing patience and patience, perfection, we instead resort to our carnal passions as we become enraged that something wrong might happen in this world that impacts us. The Lord is going to use various trials. He's going to allow us to suffer the troubles of this world so that we can learn how to walk in the victory of saving faith. And in this way, those who walk by faith in Jesus Christ are being perfected as we patiently endure the trials and the troubles of this world. And in this, we can count it all joy when we find ourselves facing the troubles of this world. Not only that, but the trials and the troubles of this world help us to look forward to a day when the Lord will finally solve the problem of evil. Let's consider how the psalmist puts it here in the 10th Psalm. If you would look with me there beginning at verse 12. Here the psalmist declares, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Now here in this verse we find the psalmist pleading with the Lord to rise up. He's basically saying, rise up, God. You know, stop hiding. Stop standing afar off. Rise up and address the problem of evil. That word arise is translated from a Hebrew word, which in this context is used in reference to those who rise up with hostile intent in order to show their power. So, uh, you know, with this definition in mind, the psalmist is clearly praying for the day when the Lord will rise up and punish those who afflict the people of God. In similar fashion, we too should allow the afflictions of this world 
to refocus our faith on the future. We should allow uh, you know, the, the, the evil things that happen in this world to, to bring us back to, uh, to the mindset that we should be looking forward to the day of judgment, that we should look forward to the finish line of our faith when, when the Lord Jesus returns and judges the wicked. With this as the focus, we can rest today in the reality that this world will never be perfect until Jesus is ruling and reigning from the throne. And if the Lord allowed the world to be perfect today without Jesus on the throne, well, then we would be complacent in our faith here in this world. So, yeah, he allows the trials and the troubles of this world to keep our focus moving forward to the finish line as we look forward to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. At the same time, we ought to pray for those who are currently being oppressed by the sinful schemes of the wicked. And as we know, there are many who are suffering because of the wicked people here in this world. And with that, I want to consider the example that's set by the psalmist here in our text tonight. Look with me again at Psalm chapter 10. We'll begin reading at verse 13. Here the psalmist writes, Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, You will not require an account. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Now here in these verses we find the psalmist. He's poetically praying for the Lord so that he might come and punish the wicked and and to, to punish those who oppress the helpless. And so he's saying, hey, the helpless have committed themselves to you, O Lord. And so why aren't you coming and protecting them? Why aren't you coming and dealing with those who are oppressing them? As we consider this prayer request, I can't help but to remember that when it comes to the help that the Lord provides to us, the Lord Jesus actually refers to the Holy Spirit as our helper. You know, the psalmist is praying for God to help the helpless And this reminds me of how the Holy Spirit is called our helper. For example, it's in John chapter 15, where the Lord Jesus declares, When the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's referring to the Holy Spirit as our helper. And with that being the case, listen, those who trust in Jesus Christ can rejoice in knowing that we are not helpless. If you feel helpless and you find yourself in the middle of a situation and you just feel just completely helpless, my question to you is this, where's the Holy Spirit? Didn't you receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of your conversion to Christ? If so, I remind you, The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, is our heavenly helper. And and what this means then is that the Christian who has become the temple of God has the Spirit of God dwelling within us, and so the Holy Spirit is always here to help us. And so if you feel helpless, then where's your focus? Where is the focus of your faith? Is it not on either you and your limitations or on the enemy and the power they hold. Either place is the wrong focus because you and your limitations, yeah, you're right, you're limited. We as humans are very limited. And are there wicked, evil people who who want to oppress us and afflict us to have more power than us? Yep, no doubt about it. Do they have more power than the Holy Spirit? No. And, And so why not look to the Holy Spirit our heavenly helper, to help us in our time of need. That's where we should look, and and that's what I encourage you to do tonight. If you feel helpless, it's because your focus is in the wrong place. Focus on the heavenly help that we have from the helper, and the Holy Spirit will help you. We should also consider the way in which the psalmist asks the Lord to break the arms of the wicked and the evil. I love that. 
Lord, just break their arms. Just crank their arms up behind their back. Go Steven Seagal on them, you know, and just start cracking elbows. No, that's not, that's not what he's saying. In this culture, the arm was a symbol of power. You know, when we talk about, you know, the right arm of God, you know, we're, we're talking about his infinite power. A reference to the arm was a reference to power. And so when the psalmist asks the Lord to break the arm of the wicked, he was actually asking the Lord to destroy the power of those who are renouncing him. We too should pray that the power of the wicked will be destroyed by the Lord. We ought to be praying that that the, the power of the wicked will be destroyed here in America. And it's for this reason that, you know, while I'm always the first person to say we ought to go vote, I, I encourage you, don't go vote for wicked people. You, you know, if, if there's somebody who wants to, you know, continue legalizing abortion and, and legalizing, you know, drugs and these sorts of things, I, I, how can a Christian vote for that? That's a vote for wickedness. Well, it's the lesser of two evils. So we're supposed to vote for evil, just a lesser form of evil? I, I, I reject the lesser of two evils doctrine all day long. We ought to be voting for and demanding from these political parties that we're only going to vote for, for godly people. Otherwise, we're actually putting wicked people in power and then complaining about the wickedness they engage in. I mean, that's hypocrisy. To vote for a wicked person and then complain about their wickedness doesn't make any sense. I'll remind you that the Lord is the one who raises up kings and he's the one that brings them down. And we ought to be praying for the Lord to give us godly leaders so that we can be saved from those who have wicked intent in these powerful positions. Well, sadly, we're probably going to end up with more wicked leaders in the future and with that being the case, I want to give you a final word of encouragement. If you would, let's turn our attention back to the, to the 10th Psalm. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 16. Here the psalmist declares, The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his, hand, uh, out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Christian, listen, no matter what's happening here in this world, and regardless of how bad things are going to get, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord is king forever and ever. Whoever is in the White House still is existing under the king of kings. And the king of kings is ultimately in control. And he is the one who works all things together for the good of those who love him. And while it's true that he allows evildoers to use their free will to oppress the afflicted here in this season of our lives, it's also true that he's still the one seated upon the throne over heaven and earth. Therefore, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord, while he's allowing evil people to engage in wicked works today, it's also true that he's eventually going to solve the problem of evil on the day when he judges those who would not repent of their wickedness. With that being the case, I just want to take a moment to remind you that those who trust in Jesus Christ, we've actually been called to refrain ourselves from any attempt at achieving our own vengeance. Now, we might be tempted to retaliate against those who have afflicted us, and yet we've been called to overcome evil with good. I like the way that Paul puts it in Romans chapter 12. It's beginning at verse 17 where he declares, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Christian, listen, rather than repaying evil with evil, you know, we've been called to overcome evil with good. And one of the best ways to do this, I believe, is by 
presenting those who afflict us with the gospel message of grace. When, when people come against us and, and attempt to oppress us and afflict us and these sorts of things, the best thing that we can do is simply share the gospel of grace with them, to, to, to present them with the good news about Jesus Christ. I'll remind you that the Lord isn't willing that any should perish, but desires all to come to repentance. And you better believe that this includes the evil people who are engaging in works of wickedness. The Lord wants them to come to repentance. The Lord wants them to be saved. And so rather than spending all of our time and energy attempting to avenge ourselves because someone hurt our fifis or, or, or you know, messed up our day or whatever the case, let's instead leave the work of vengeance in the hands of the Lord. He'll, he'll do a much better job with that. Let's simply wait for the day of judgment when the Lord is going to you know, solve the problem of evil. But until that day, we have to be spending the time that we have sharing the good news about Jesus Christ with those who are lost. Because I believe that this is the best way for Christians to overcome evil with good.